Assalamualaikum khawatin hasrat. Wasim Hasan welcomes you to lecture number 11 of Marketing for Nonprofits MKT 628 at the Virtual University of Pakistan. The component of learning is on stages of consumer behavior. We all know that the primary job of any marketer is influencing the behavior of the target market. Until the behavior is influenced the way the marketer desires, the transaction will not take place. And a transaction in the context of nonprofits is giving of some sacrifice, going through a certain level of inconvenience, and getting something in return in the form of a benefit or a reward. An excellent example is quitting smoking and going through the pains of or the withdrawal of a very well established and uh, entrenched habit and ensuring in return with a better health. So, until the behavior of the target market is influenced by the marketer, nothing is going to move forward. It is therefore very important with what really the forms of behavior and what are the factors that can be instrumental in changing the behavior the way the marketer desires. Behaviors are classified as simple behaviors and complex behaviors. The fact of the matter is that most of the behaviors are complex, they become simple as a result of certain efforts undertaken by the marketing people. And uh, at the end of a fruitful uh, marketing campaign, the behaviors manifested by the target market become simple and simple behaviors are reflected in their taking the desired decision toward a certain behavior change. We therefore have to talk about the complexity of behaviors. And toward that complexity, I think we do understand that behaviors are not formed overnight. It takes the years and years uh, before you know, those behaviors are formed and manifested the way they are. And therefore, as the marketing people, we have to understand the underlying currents that form that complexity. Experts classify exchanges as low involvement exchanges and high involvement exchanges. Well, there is a direct correlation between the level of involvement and simplicity or complexity. In other words, if an issue is uh, simple and uh, the decision making on part of the consumer is not going to take a long time, it is going to be a low involvement exchange. Conversely, if the issue is complex, complex in the sense that because the target market has certain perceptions about that uh, issue and they have certain very well entrenched kind of habits and values which uh, are difficult to change and the issue therefore happens to be complex and the target market takes a lot more time to convince themselves that uh, they are all set to bring about a change in their behavior the way the marketer desires. And therefore we can say there's a direct correlation between uh, the involvement level and the level of simplicity or complexity involved in this equation. I'm going to show you this with the help of a graphical presentation in a short while, but let me say here that uh, the simple behaviors are not the ones I'm going to talk about. I'll, I'll rather talk about the complexity of behaviors because that is the, something the which the we should uh, uh, put our focus on. There are um, quite a few factors that uh, people consider before uh, they change their behavior or before they start considering a change in their well-set and established behaviors. Let me give you the example of uh, polio vaccination here. Just look at the opposition that the people generally have toward that vaccination program, thinking that um, the, the babies may develop certain medical complications in the later years of their life. 
which of course happens to be a very negative perception. But this is kind of uh, a consideration which people have before they start considering a change toward the behavior, meaning what is going to be uh, the price I may have to pay if I change the behavior and what is going to be the reward. Uh, once they are convinced, they take the decision. Uh, people uh, might consider things like uh, what is going to be the personal uh, cost and uh, the economic and social cost uh, if they do not change a particular behavior. I'll go back to the example of uh, the quit smoking campaign, uh, which uh, is uh, all about uh, uh, bringing uh, some benefits to the target market uh, who are into smoking. So uh, the people think uh, there are going to be many social pressures uh, if they did not quit smoking and uh, if they did, um, they are going to get uh, the approbation uh, from their peers, uh, the friends, relatives, and so on and so forth. And on top of all that, they are going to ensure a better, healthier, and happier life. People may also look at um, the possible impact of uh, the behavior change on their self-image. If they think uh, their self-image will improve as a result of changing their behavior, they will certainly be quick on making the decision and manifesting a change of behavior. So the marketing people have to understand the undercurrents and the complexity of uh, the factors which uh, the target market considers before they bring about a change in their behavior. And uh, there are certain uh, the tools at their disposal to find out to the stage the target market is at. One of them happens to be the marketing research about which I'm gonna talk about in one of the following components. But the fact here is that the real challenge for the marketing people is to fully understand the thought process uh, that, that goes on in the minds of the consumers and then uh, put together their marketing moves to respond to the challenges their thought process uh, poses. Um, in other words, uh, the marketing people have to uh, bring about simplicity uh, in the complex thought process uh, by putting together campaigns uh, which can do that particular job. Um, I'm going to talk about that uh, later because uh, we have to understand the stages through which uh, consumers pass uh, before they start considering a change of behavior. Experts uh, classify these stages into uh, the four different uh, steps. The one is the pre-contemplation stage. The second one is contemplation stage. The third one is known as preparation and action, whereas the fourth one is uh, maintenance stage. The terminology for each stage is uh, the kind of self-explanatory and uh, the pre-contemplation stage basically reflects uh, everything and anything that goes on before the, the campaign has been launched. So in other words, it basically reflects almost no awareness on part of the target market. The uh, marketing people do know what's going on at their end. They are the ones who are putting together the campaign, but the target market is not really aware of what is going on at that particular end. They may have an inkling of that particular campaign through the friends, peers, and their neighbors, or maybe through um, people from the neighboring village where the campaign either has been launched or is in the process of being launched. For example, visits taken, uh, undertaken by the medical teams of um, the organization uh, trying to uh, level the ground uh, for launching that campaign, uh, the well uh, spread the word around, and uh, everybody in the neighboring villages uh, will have uh, some idea of uh, what's going on uh, in their neighborhood. So this is a stage uh, where people have not yet started uh, considering the internal factors uh, which uh, bring about uh, a change of behavior. And at the same time, they're not really aware of the complete moves uh, that uh, are planned by the, uh, the marketing people. However, they may have an idea of uh, the, the marketing campaign through external sources of which marketing people may as well be a part. Like I talked about the pre-distribution uh, visits undertaken by the organization or distribution uh, the visits uh, when the campaign is underway. However, the one thing is very important about this stage is that the target market does not really weigh the costs they have to pay and the benefits they may get, or rather will get, uh, by paying those costs. This is something which takes place in the second stage, which is known as the contemplation stage. And uh, as the terminology suggests, this uh, reflects uh, the people's awareness of uh, the issue. And this is the stage uh, where they start uh, weighing 
the costs they pay in terms of certain sacrifices, the by changing their belief system, their value system, and uh, start considering rather favorably the benefits that they might get if they changed their behavior. So this is a stage uh, where people uh, start contemplating a change of behavior. Uh, some are early contemplators and some are late contemplators, but the fact remains that, uh, that this is a stage which marks a very careful study of uh, the costs versus the benefits. The next stage is uh, the preparation and action. And uh, I would say again, as the terminology suggests, that this is the stage uh, where people uh, demonstrate a buy-in of the concept which is being sold to them by the marketers. So this is a stage where marketers see success because they see people getting ready to change the behavior in favor of what they really want. Here, I would like to take you back to the two particular factors that I talked about earlier, the factor of others and the factor of self-efficacy. Others also are responsible in giving the final push to the change in behavior of the target market and uh, the factor of uh, self-efficacy that gives uh, confidence to the target market in terms of uh, managing by themselves a change of behavior on their own, in other words. However, it is the final push which is given by the marketing people in order to stage the, uh, the final change of behavior. The final stage is that of uh, the maintenance stage uh, where marketing people have the challenge to make sure that uh, the behavior stands changed, remains changed. In the meaning, the influence they have exerted on um, the target market uh, should uh, remain as is. And uh, it calls for uh, a lot of challenge uh, because uh, people do have a tendency to go back to their old behavior uh, patterns. Uh, for example, uh, research shows that 80% of smokers go back to smoking after they have quit it. There are uh, other people who uh, go back to the old behavior of not taking any the medication which was prescribed to them by the marketing team that was working on a medical program convincing uh, the target market that uh, they have to take medication in order to prevent a certain deadly disease. Because they do not see any observable change in their body, they seem to think that things would still have been the same if they had not taken that medication. And therefore, they show the tendency to adopt the early behavior that uh, they manifested before the marketing program was undertaken. An equivalent of this uh, on the commercial side is people uh, switching over to another brand, meaning losing the brand loyalty. So uh, this um, is kind of a reflection uh, of uh, the marketing failure uh, on part of the marketing people if people uh, go back to their uh, the old behaviors. A very important stage and uh, once um, marketing people find their target market in this particular stage, it is for them to come up with strategies that uh, can ensure that uh, the target market will keep uh, exhibiting uh, the behavior which already has been influenced as a result of uh, the marketing effort. What is the marketing implication here? Okay, we've talked about the complexity of uh, consumer behavior and uh, the need for marketing people to understand that complexity so that, uh, that they can uh, get come up with uh, the right marketing campaign. This basically is the implication. Any concept that, uh, that we learn in the context of um, a nonprofit or anything else, it really uh, boils down to coming up with uh, the right uh, set of strategies because formulation of strategies and executing strategies is the name of the strategic game. The whole strategic process that, uh, that we have learned should owe to a complete understanding of consumer behavior and then the ability on part of the marketing people to come up with the right set of strategies so that they succeed in influencing the behavior they want. The marketing people, in other words, have to determine at what stage they find their target market at. Uh, do they find it in stage one, two, three, or four? So whatever they find their target market at, they have to come up with um, compatible, relevant marketing strategies. In other words, if they find their uh, target market at uh, stage number one, which is pre-contemplation, then it means they have to create awareness. So the dynamics of uh, the launching of a program will be dominant in that campaign. If they are dealing with uh, the target market at uh, stage number two, they are mostly going to talk about the benefits 
the target market derives out of the program because it is the benefit side that has to be uh, the very dominant um, in terms of telling the market that um, the sacrifices and inconveniences that they have to pay and go through uh, in terms of uh, the uh, cost side is going to be more than offset by the benefits they're going to get out of the program. And that is going to be the beauty of the campaign, uh, telling uh, the, your target market they must change their behavior if they really want certain benefits. If the market happens to be at stage three, where they are uh, getting ready to take the action because uh, they have um, bought the concept, then um, you have to come up with uh, communications uh, accordingly. It may be in the personal communications, the meaning personal interaction, it may be uh, a huge um, campaign consisting of a different media, meaning a multimedia campaign. If you find your target market at the last stage, which is that of maintenance, I think uh, quite a few words have been said by me earlier. You have to make sure that they do not go back to the old behavioral patterns because that is going to be the failure of the marketing program. So in other words, here, the name of the game is going to be reinforcement of the message. It is like um, advertising um, being done uh, for a product which is well established and which already has been accepted by the market. And now you want to make sure that uh, the people go for repeat purchases and uh, in the process develop a brand loyalty. Similarly, in the non-profit context, you've got to make sure that people who have shown uh, a change of behavior because you have been uh, able to influence their behavior do not go back to the old thing and uh, stay where they are. This is a huge challenge uh, because research has shown that 80% of smokers go back to smoking after they have quitted. And uh, people, whatever program they have been subjected to, they should stay where they are after they have shown a change of behavior. That's the crux of the matter. This component is on marketing research. The very fundamental question here is, why marketing research? And the very fundamental answer is, we need to carry out marketing research because we need to have certain strategic answers to certain strategic questions without which we cannot move forward with our program. We cannot afford to be vague we have to bring into a sharp focus all the issues which we need to clarify. And therefore, I would like to take you through all those five or six different steps a market researcher has to put together to carry out his marketing research program. First of all, the marketing researcher has to identify the problem. The second step is coming up with the research design. And the third step is about identifying all those tools uh, that are going to be instrumental toward making that uh, design work. And uh, then we collect data, analyze data, and then present a report. These are the six uh, fundamental steps any the market researcher has to go through. In the context of uh, nonprofit marketing, we have to be extremely uh, clear about the issue at hand and the answers that we are looking for. Um, if we are having a problem, we need a resolution to that problem, or uh, there's an opportunity that we really want to seize, and uh, we want very clear answers to that particular issue, we need to carry out marketing research. Uh, it is not really important that uh, we carry out a very comprehensive research in the context of nonprofit marketing, but nevertheless, we do have to understand as a refresher all these five or six different steps that need to be put together to come up with a research program. So like I said, in the very first place, it is extremely significant to be very clear about the problem identification. Until we really can bring into focus the problem or the issue at hand, we cannot have uh, an accurate uh, marketing research or the mechanism. Once the, the problem is identified, we move ahead see with the research design. The problem therefore lays the ground uh, for uh, anything and everything that follows. One practice that is uh, generally followed by many organizations, and I would recommend uh, you following the same practice, is coming up with a 
hypothetical report after you have identified the problem. What you do is, if you are uh, in a state of predicament, whether to go for this option or that option, come up with a report by plugging in hypothetical numbers and uh, get the answers to whether you should go for absolutely free meals or subsidized meals or a combination of those. And once you present the results to uh, the people who are responsible for making the final decision, then you will be in a better position to ask even uh, more appropriate questions when it comes to putting together your research. And once you have carried out the research, you can uh, plug in the actual numbers that you have uh, generated uh, through the, uh, the market research process. And uh, that is going to give you a lot of confidence toward uh, the making uh, decisions, which should be better than if you had not gone through the marketing research process. The marketing research process uh, assures uh, the better decisions because of a higher level of confidence. Um, it does not really guarantee the 100% uh, of your success. I must point that out. Once you have done that, you get on to the next step, which is putting together the research design. Well, this is a stage where you put together the plan of action and the real plan of attack, so to say. And this is where you decide what exactly is going to be the design of the research, the meaning whether it is going to be qualitative in nature, uh, or um, exploratory, so to say, or it is going to be descriptive in nature, meaning quantitative, or it is going to be causal. Um, just a few words about uh, all these three types of uh, research designs uh, so that uh, we can be sure which one is uh, the best under different possible situations in a nonprofit context. The Exploratory or uh, qualitative research uh, is about all those issues uh, which are not very clear to the organization. Uh, we do have uh, a vague understanding of the issue and uh, we can uh, talk a lot about that particular issue, but we do not really have very concrete answers. And therefore, we like to get into some kind of research to broaden our understanding of the issue. Once we broaden the issue, uh, that helps us narrow down the focus and give us a greater depth into the whole thing. And that is where we start asking the right questions. And uh, needless to say, we all understand what qualitative or exploratory research is. It is all about uh, asking people uh, their opinions of the issue at hand. And therefore, we form um, focus groups, we get into the interviews, and uh, we, in other words, interact with uh, small groups or individuals who we think can get us the right answers. The second uh, type of uh, possible research design is uh, a quantitative research. Well, this is uh, the research that uh, expands the base of uh, the qualitative research that we have carried out. Uh, we understand the trends uh, uh, relating the issue. And uh, we also have some very qualitative answers, but we have to quantify uh, those particular trends by expanding our design and asking those questions to so many different people. Because the intention here is to generate data. So in other words, we can say that this is where the real meat and bones of the whole process is. And uh, we get into asking them the very uh, the pinpointed questions so that we can generate the right amount of data. Uh, what is going to be the sample size and uh, how we are going to go after them and uh, what is it that we are going to do to incentivize them are all the part of the research design. You put together all that and uh, generate data to interpret that. But once you are done with it, you are done with the quantitative process. Um, and then the uh, third type of research is the, the causal research, which happens to be uh, the most specific of uh, the research designs, uh, because this lets you uh, develop certain uh, causal relationships between different variables. Uh, for example, you can uh, draw a relationship between the demographic features of uh, the relatives or the family members of those elderly people who you think form the a prospective target market for the nursing home. 
And um, if uh, you think uh, that there is uh, going to be a relationship between um, the de demographics of one constituent and the intention uh, on part of them to let their elders to go to the nursing home, then this research is the one you must carry out okay, because this gives you very specific answers. You may also have certain questions uh, that uh, they may reveal certain uh, psychographic uh, relationships uh, between um, the constituent that makes the decision for their elders and uh, the final decision uh, on the elders going to the nursing home. So causal research is uh, something uh, the more specific and more authentic, gives you a lot of leads into the making the good decisions. After uh, we have chosen uh, which uh, type of uh, research design uh, we need to undertake, uh, we are all set to carry out the research. If uh, we are going to go for qualitative uh, the model, then um, we put together uh, questions for uh, uh, the moderators uh, because you know that uh, qualitative research is carried out with the help of moderators. Uh, they are the ones who talk with uh, the focus group or individuals, they interview and so on and so forth. If uh, the model is uh, or the design is um, quantitative, in other words, descriptive, then uh, we have to have a different uh, the type of a questionnaire uh, which is going to be lengthy, which is going to be comprehensive, and uh, which is uh, going to be uh, the basis of the survey uh, which uh, you are going to uh, carry out as part of this uh, the research. And if uh, the design is uh, causal, the questions are going to be formed accordingly. With this, you're all set to carry out the research. Whatever the design, you are now out to collect data, whether through focus groups, or interviews, or surveys, you are out to collect the data that you desire to generate. Here, I would like to say one thing. Before you go all out with the exercise, especially in terms of comprehensive surveys, when you are carrying out quantitative research, you like to go for uh, a sample data collection exercise because you don't really want to waste your resources and uh, you want to make sure that the design that you have put together is going to work uh, the way you want. You carry out uh, this research in a restricted area or with a restricted sample. Uh, you decide on the basis of uh, the different variables what exactly is going to be uh, the sample of this particular exercise and those variables basically are a function of economy and efficiency. Otherwise, so you have the same questions and you have the same techniques to follow out, uh, to, to rather carry out research. Uh, the sample uh, research exercise uh, will uh, get you certain uh, observations on the basis of which you may like to bring about certain changes to questions which you have put together as part of the survey. And uh, therefore, when it is a question of a comprehensive research um, requiring uh, huge resources uh, or say sizable resources, you must be careful. And more so in a non-profit context um, than uh, a commercial context because uh, non-profit organizations are always the short of funds. Um, and given the fact that uh, funds are generated through outside sources in most of the cases, Nonprofit organizations have got to be even more careful when they are out to carry out these surveys, if at all they are doing that. Because in many of the cases, nonprofits should be okay with focus groups and other qualitative research methods. Back to the sample data collection, and on the basis of that, going all out, we are all set to carry out the research. Once we are done with that, we are down to the next stage, which is analysis of data. We have collected data and we have to structure that data into so many different forms, into different segments, so that we can get answers to the demographic features or to psychographics and you know, come up with the right segments of the population, um, which I'm going to talk about in one of the following lectures. Uh, the fact remains that uh, the structured form of um, data analysis is uh, going to be the right most uh, professional way to interpret data. Interpretation of data is going to give us insights into the making certain strategies. So in other words, from the uh, quantitative side, we're now moving back to the qualitative side, and therefore we have to have 
uh, the right uh, the most numbers that can um, become the basis of good qualitative decisions. And uh, once we have interpreted, you see, the data and uh, come up with the interpretations, then uh, we can um, prepare our report, present that report, and seek uh, the decisions that we require in order to move ahead with the program. So this is, uh, in brief, the uh, six um, different steps of carrying out marketing research. And I will say it again. The reason I've talked about these steps is because we have to be clear about which one of these is most appropriate in our nonprofit context. If we go back to uh, different examples that uh, we have been learning through uh, different components, we'll see which one uh, is uh, compatible with which example. This component is on marketing research in a nonprofit context, meaning why is it that we have to carry out research uh, for a nonprofit organization? Well, the fact remains uh, it gives a lot of credibility and relevance to the nonprofit organization. We know that uh, nonprofit organizations have to depend a lot on outside sources, uh, the meaning donors, and therefore, in order to stay relevant and credible in their eyes, nonprofit organizations have to carry out marketing research to assure all the constituents that uh, they have a total grip of the environment and they understand uh, all the trends that are taking place uh, within the marketplace and the developments uh, that are affecting the nonprofit or uh, have the potential to affect the nonprofit in terms of uh, either presenting certain problems or presenting certain opportunities uh, have to be uh, pinpointed with the help of research. And therefore, um, NPOs uh, they do get into research to convince all those constituents that they are on the right track. In other words, they have to convince all the constituents that uh, they do not base their uh, decision making on just plain observation and uh, reflections. Uh, however um, systematic those uh, reflections may be, um, they proceed uh, with the help of all those tools which are uh, a significant part of the management process, meaning strategic uh, marketing management process. And therefore, the need for the marketing research. When it comes to marketing research, there is a misperception about it, uh, especially in the context of nonprofits, that uh, it has to be very comprehensive. And whenever people talk about marketing research, everybody's mind wanders toward uh, what I said, descriptive or quantitative research, meaning surveys. We do not really have to carry out surveys all the time uh, within the nonprofits, uh, the way we carry out surveys for commercial enterprises. Um, you know, we want to check you know, the level of brand loyalty. We want to check what is it that is uh, making our customers move away from the brand. We want to check you know, what people think of the distribution system and so on and so forth. There could be so many different hypotheses on which uh, these surveys uh, can be based and are based. Here, in a nonprofit uh, the context, uh, there are uh, the certain things which may not be subjected to uh, the quantitative marketing research. And uh, the fact remains that uh, in many situations, qualitative research, which is a, a combination of uh, the focus groups and interviews, and which uh, characterizes interaction, uh, direct interaction, either with individuals or with uh, the small and smaller groups, uh, the ISC, the what forms the qualitative research, and that is something NPOs can really bank on. With these findings, uh, the U.S. marketing managers and marketing researchers are all set to uh, put your uh, data together, analyze that uh, data, interpret it, and uh, the generate certain uh, vital uh, the sets of information that uh, different constituents require to uh, give you go-ahead for uh, some very strategic decisions. The constituents uh, who are extremely important to the organization uh, under these circumstances are uh, your board of directors, along with uh, the top management of the organization, and donors, uh, because uh, they are the ones uh, who uh, play a significant role uh, toward sustaining the organization, and therefore uh, you've got to prove it to them that you have a complete understanding of all the segments of the external environment and the interplay of that uh, environment uh, with the internal uh, the setup. Uh, you can also throw light on uh, how things uh, will look like in the 
in the short run, in the medium term, and also in the longer run. Once okay, you have uh, proved uh, your understanding, okay, you have gone much beyond just proving a point that you are a good market researcher. Okay, as a matter of fact, you, know, okay, you have to prove your complete mastery of the overall environment of the organization. And that is why I said to keep themselves relevant and credible, NPOs could have to carry out marketing research from time to time. And this marketing research could, may not have to be very comprehensive um, in the form of uh, quantitative surveys. This could be uh, a qualitative exercise could, whereby could, you seek opinions could, from different uh, could, people um, by forming focus groups, by getting into interviews, and uh, any other uh, way of interaction uh, that uh, can get you uh, some vital inputs uh, toward all those decisions that are to be made for the organization. Let me give you a couple of examples uh, to further explain uh, what I've been saying. You would like to find out uh, why the donors uh, donate money. What is it that really uh, motivates them uh, to donate toward the cause that you are addressing? Because this is a question which may be asked by one of the sponsors of the organization. Why should your donors keep on donating money to you all the time? And if you have certain specific results to support your answer, you are going to be better off. And you can talk in more convincing terms, which are going to be based on research and not just observations and reflections, like I said earlier. You may like to find out why certain donors are moving away from the program that you initiated and toward which they were very enthusiastic to begin with, but now they have started donating to some other cause. You have this feeling that they are donating to some other cause and therefore you would like to get into research to find out what that cause is and why they are moving toward that cause. So in other words, you have to find out what is it that others are doing those others could may be uh, the organizations that are addressing a similar cause or a cause different from yours, but it happens to be a cause for social welfare. And therefore, you need to find out what is it that, that is driving them away from you and into somebody else's favor. These are the kind of facts that you need to unearth. Um, you uh, may like to uh, find out uh, who are uh, the donors contributing toward your cause as a consequence of a cost marketing relationship. Now here you see, I'm gonna talk about a couple of things that we already have learned. Just imagine yourself uh, getting out of a cost marketing relationship and you're done with the exercise which has been positive and it has given you good results. What has happened as a consequence of that um, exercise is that certain consumers are part of your target market has developed with what experts call uh, customer corporate identification. And you want to extend that customer corporate identification from those customers' loyalty toward that organization to yours, meaning to your nonprofit organization. So what's going to happen? We all know that as a result of cost marketing, people who are socially conscious uh, do support the organizations or support those commercial entities that they want to work for a certain cause. Uh, because of the fact that those uh, the socially um, conscious uh, consumers could have their own uh, the sets of beliefs and values, and uh, when they find out that certain corporate sector organizations also have the same set of values and they want to do something uh, for social welfare, they become very loyal to those organizations and they start supporting those organizations by buying their products. You need to extend that identification to your organization uh, because you would like those customers to be uh, loyal to your organization even after the relationship has expired, meaning the cost marketing relationship. And therefore, you may have the need to carry out some kind of research uh, to make sure that uh, those people um, stay loyal with, with your organization and uh, remain your donors. You may like to find out through qualitative research uh, what really motivates people to become volunteers. If you have certain goals uh, which are uh, volunteer dependent, then it is very important to know uh, what really is it so that you can uh, 
uh, be in uh, close association with them all the time and not be let down given the time for them to make their contribution comes. So we can say that uh, the help of uh, the research findings, uh, you can make uh, your marketing case very convincing and uh, be uh, very credible and relevant in the eyes of uh, all the constituents that uh, matter for the sustenance of the NPO. One thing we must keep in mind all the time is that uh, in the nonprofit context, marketing research must not be carried out if its findings are not going to have a direct application to a particular issue. That issue may relate to a certain problem or it may relate to a certain opportunity which we want to capitalize on. If there is no direct impact of the findings of the marketing research on that issue, it should not be carried out. Or rather, it must not be carried out. It is uh, the different from the commercial setup in which uh, you carry out marketing research because you want to generate uh, information even for times to come. And uh, you keep doing that uh, by way of carrying out usage and attitude tests as to uh, what is it that keeps them loyal to the product all the time and what is it to see that makes them go away and so on and so forth. Those are the kind of studies which uh, commercial enterprises carry out from time to time even if there is uh, no pressing need for that because it is a different ball game altogether and the intensity of competition um, has uh, a certain different kind of dynamics in that environment which is not the case for NPOs. NPOs are dependent on revenues which are not generated by themselves. NPOs depend on donations which are given by the donors and uh, therefore uh, the revenue stream has a very different character uh, given the uh, limitedness of uh, the budgets at the disposal of NPOs. They have to be very uh, prudent and, uh, and fastidious uh, when it comes to the making the decision on whether they should go ahead with marketing research or not. But the fact remains, research should be carried out so that uh, marketing people can get insights into uh, the behavioral patterns of uh, the target market. They can find out uh, which stage of uh, behavior, uh, the modification their target market is at, um, and uh, then make uh, the better decisions in terms of communication strategies. Uh, the fact is, with the help of marketing research, uh, so many different issues should be simplified. They should be made uh, more convincing, and uh, they should become the basis of uh, the certain strategic decisions which are good for the health of the organization. Thanks.